Good evening, uh, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, important event uh, this evening. Uh, firstly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Professor Michael Cox. I'm a founding, the founding director, I should say, of Ideas. Uh, a very active think tank here at the LSE, which I help run with my partner in crime, who's sitting in the front row keeping an eye on me here, uh, Arnie Wester. Um, our new director, recently appointed, Craig Calhoun, Professor Craig Calhoun, recently observed that the LSE shapes and leads public uh, debate. Uh, in our own modest, uh, but we think not insignificant way, we hope that we and Ideas are contributing to that mission by engaging with the big issues of the day, by drawing in different kinds of people, from different walks of life and, of course, from different countries. We did this two weeks ago in a discussion we organized on Europe, uh, led by Robert Cooper. We will be doing it again next month in a conference on the global financial crisis. And we're doing it again tonight with this roundtable entitled The Global Drugs War. Made official by the United States in the mid-1970s, the war continues over 35 years later, claiming more and more lives, most obviously now in Mexico, and destabilizing, or so many would argue, more and more countries. If this is a war, it looks like one the United States is clearly not winning. Or is this too pessimistic an analysis? We shall see. To answer these and many other questions tonight, we have a great team who have been discussing these issues all day uh, in an ideas forum. A great team of experts, three from the United States itself, uh, Bill McAllister, uh, David Courtright, and Ethan Nadelman. And I, I have to mention the fact that he's an, he's an LSE a master student from the IR department. I was told to mention that, so I've mentioned it, Ethan. Uh, and finally, uh, Nigel Inkster from the United Kingdom. Uh, they will each speak for 15 minutes, and then we will move on to the questions and answers. So could we give all four a proper LSE welcome? Um, my day job, I work at the U.S. Department of State, but I'm not on my day job today, so I need to give the standard disclaimer, which is that what you're about to hear is my own personal academic research and does not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. government, the Department of State, or the current administration. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, my other job is I'm an adjunct uh, professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and I see many of you in the crowd who would appear to be of studential age, and I assume that some of you are here at the invitation or perhaps even the insistence of your professors, and therefore, by the power invested in me by Georgetown University, I give you all extra credit. <laughs> all right. uh, now, my job is simply to explain the parameters of the international drug control system. And I decided not to just read this to you or throw up a bunch of sort of the standard chart you see. So I invented something which no one else has seen, and they are free to disavow themselves of it. And I'm not even sure I've got it all right myself, but I thought I'd try to sort of give you a pictorial version of what the system looks like. And I'm talking here specifically about the international treaties and the international drug control system, not the uh, local level or national level regulations that may differ in many regards. All right? So here we go. So what, uh, the way to think about this, I think, is sort of a four-layer structure. And the, the best way to do this, I'm not sufficiently um, expert in the technology, but if you think of a goblet, which has a, a top, middle, skinny in the middle, and then bottom, there's sort of a base. This is sort of what it's supposed to look like. So the treaty framework is at sort of the top of the structure. Then the international organizations those treaties uh, create. Then the states party that actually uh, uh, sign, adhere to the treaties in the first place and interact with the structure, the international organizations and then the domestic constituencies that make up states. So they're sort of all connected like this. All right? So let's take a look at the treaty framework first. We have my little spinny things, and off we go. Okay. So the treaty framework is made up of three different treaties. The single convention, uh, which deals with opiates and opioids, that's heroin and things like that, uh, morphine, coca and cocaine and cannabis. Right? The 1971 psychotropic convention deals with stimulants, depressants, hallucinogens, drugs like that. And then there's another treaty in 1988, uh, which deals primarily with trafficking and with uh, 
making sure that the laws, different sorts of countries' laws, can be uh, used in such a way to have a uniform <laughs> approach to dealing with people who are, are arrested or with drug traffickers, things like that. However, there are also a couple of schedules in this treaty to deal with precursor substances that one can use to make uh, the substances in the 61 and 72 treaty, and there are certain sorts of reporting measures in the 1988 treaty. Now, so this is the first level, and uh, these produce what I call, for lack of a better term, the drug triangle, and that looks like this. Okay, so at the top of the drug triangle, the most strictly controlled drugs are the drugs from the, from the older treaty, uh, the 61 treaty, uh, opium, like that. The psychotropic treaty has a lower level of control. In fact, I wouldn't even call it control, really. It's more a matter of tracking. Thirdly, tobacco uh, isn't really in the same category. I decided to put it here. My colleagues may disagree. It should even be here. There's now a, a recent treaty called the Framework Convention on Tobacco, which really is a very different kind of, of agreement. It's really much more of a public health approach. So it, in some ways, it really doesn't fit. But I thought I'd put it on just to sort of show the levels of control from most stringent at the top to least stringent at the bottom. Then we have the substances that aren't controlled at all by international treaty alcohol, inhalants, and the ones I'm going to say others for now, I'll explain what that means a little bit later. Uh, inhalants are drugs you, you can inhale, substances you can inhale that you find in your garage or under your kitchen sink, and they will get you high at the cost of a lot of brain cells. Uh, so that's level one. So here we have the treaty framework. The next level, the treaties create three key international organizations. Okay? The Commission on Narcotic Drugs is uh, the political representatives uh, from a number of states that come each year and discuss how to enforce the treaty, right? The International Narcotics Control Board, which we discussed quite a bit earlier today, is a, it's a semi-judicial, quasi-independent body of experts who are not supposed to represent their individual countries, but represent the interests of the community as a whole, and they're supposed to sort of enforce, if you will, the treaties, or uh, comment on whether states are uh, complying with their obligations under the treaties. The third entity is the World Health Organization, which is a separate organization, not created by the treaties themselves, but they have an important role to play in making recommendations about whether drugs ought to be placed under control or not. Okay. Now, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime is the secretariat that services the two bodies created by the treaties. Right? And secretariats and what they do are important as well. They ought not be ignored because they're an important part of the system. So, now we have the treaty framework, we have the international organizational structure. Next, the states, the governments that actually uh, sign up for the treaties and have to deal with the organizations that they have therefore created. Uh, that's the third level, pretty straightforward. And then we have, finally, the domestic constituencies, right? Now, there are, I, I just put these into four categories. One could categorize these many different ways. Development simply means uh, research and pharmaceutical companies that create new drugs or manufacture the drugs that, that now exist. Distribution are the pharmacists, or you would say chemists here, and the doctors who actually hand out the drugs, usually under prescription. Um, interest groups are any number of uh, actors that have some interest in the way the system works. So this could be Mothers Against Drunk Driving, it could be Ethan's group, um, this could be uh, the international or the national or local association of uh, chiefs of police, it could be uh, normal, the people who want to normalize or regularize marijuana usage, things like that. So there's all different sorts of domestic constituencies. And of course, the states have to deal with all these constituencies. And the last one is enforcement, the people charged with enforcing the local or national or provincial or borough, whatever level, uh, drug laws. Okay? And of course, they all talk to each other, they all communicate with each other, they all interact with each other in some way or another. Okay? So that's the way that level works. And here we have it all together. Um, so once again, the treaty framework, here we have at the top the treaties, and these are the things they control. Here we have the international organizational structure and the three bodies that uh, make up that structure. Here we have the state's party, and finally the domestic constituencies. And I think par probably a part of what we'll talk about tonight is how ultimately in the end, all this stems from a series of domestic constituencies that have something to say about this issue, and there's always a lot of interplay between them. All right? Now, let's see. Okay, I think that's it. I had one other thing I thought was going to be up there, but it's not. So let me, uh, I think I'll just stop right there then. David, are you ready? Or do you need another move? Um, I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>
history of drug policy is a lot like the history of the international attempts to control the arms race. Technology keeps raising the stakes. We keep struggling to maintain control. But until recently, we have struggled more earnestly to control some drugs as opposed to others. And that's, that's my main theme tonight. Why is it that we are keener on suppressing some drugs as opposed to substances that are more lightly re regulated? <clears throat> Why? Before answering, here's some economic history. Global drug commerce arose in tandem with European overseas empires. Once production ramped up and novel imported drugs ceased to be medical curiosities, they, they brought pleasure and solace to millions of ordinary people. Uh, drugs offered occasions of conviviality as well as brain reward. If you stop and think about it, drugs were perfect products. They were quickly consumed, they were speedily replaced by habitual users, and because of tolerance, people tended to increase the amount of the drugs that they consumed over time. Now, in addition to ordinary commercial profits, psychoactive drugs, including cheap liquor, induced native peoples to trade away their furs, to negotiate away their lands, and sell their captives into slavery. Drug commerce was a perpetual motion machine. Drugs bought slaves, and slaves made drugs which were used to buy more slaves to make still more drugs. Really, this is an economic history, the closest thing we've ever had to a perpetual motion machine. Opium, alcohol, tobacco, and coca also serve to numb, stimulate, placate uh, in debt, and otherwise exploit day laborers, soldiers, prostitutes, and other uh, nominally free workers. Governing elites in both European nations <coughs> and colonies depended very heavily on drug taxes for revenue. In fact, tax evasion, not prohibition, was the most important reason for drug smuggling uh, in the West in the 18th and 19th centuries. And indeed, the biggest problem that we historians have in trying to estimate past drug consumption is simply we're unsure of the volume of duty avoidance smuggling. However, three things are clear. I, I think it's, it's safe, the evidence strongly supports three generalizations. First, the price of drink and drugs was dropping, thanks to expanded production and more efficient manufacturing and transportation. Second, per capita consumption was increasing in the late 18th and the early 19th centuries. And third, drug-related problems threatened the social order, as well as the health and well-being of individuals. Uh, this became increasingly clear in the course of the long 19th century. Medical researchers documented the health risks of drug use, particularly of alcohol and narcotics. Political economists computed the costs of more asylum admissions, more police, more accidents, and so on. Uh, those issues, by the way, were of great concern to the Fabian founders of the London School of Economics. Oops. Anti-imperialists, economic progressives, and human rights activists, Gandhi was all three, objected to the ruinous effects of liquor and drug trafficking on subjugated classes, people, and races. You don't usually think of Gandhi in terms of being an ardent prohibitionist, but he was. Journalists and illustrators dramatized new forms of drug abuse, such as the injection of morphine through hypodermic syringes, whose number and sophistication increased during the 1870s and the 1880s. Here again, one thinks of the arms race, uh, and more broadly, of the deepest problem of modern history, how to keep technological innovations that advance civilization from also undermining and perhaps even destroying civilization. In principle, the solution for drugs was simple enough. Permit dispensing in appropriate medical circumstances restrict or forbid it in non-medical circumstances that could lead to intoxication, overdose, addiction, and dissipation. That's the general principle. Um, thus, the treaties of 1912, 1925, 1931, and the treaties that Bill described established and then tightened an international manufacturing quota system, basically it was designed to limit consumption 
to expert determined medical purposes. That, that's the rationale for the system. The 1912 Hague Opium Convention also pledged nations to enforce domestic laws to limit sales to medical uses, typically through a system of registration, record keeping, and prescription. Um, incidentally, the United States uh, attempted to do the same thing with liquor under the Volstead Act, which was really a leaky prescription law rather than a prohibition law per se. So how do we make sense of all of these policy variations? So we, we have this international treaty system, but the reality is there's a lot of local and national variation. Um, what's a simple schematic to keep track of all of this? Well, I, I suggest that you, see, you think of a graph with three axes. Um, the y-axis represents the degree of regulation. It runs from universal access for, for substances like caffeinated beverages to um, adult access for things like cigarettes to regulated adult access for substances like alcohol. Um, theoretically, you're not supposed to sell drinks to drunks and so on. Uh, and then through prescription regimes and all the way up to prohibition. The x-axis describes taxation, which can be nothing, which can be light, or which can be so heavy that it amounts to a kind of de facto prohibition. So that's why that axis ends in prohibition. And then finally, the z-axis describes the penalties for violating the rules governing sales or taxation. Uh, these range from nothing to reprimands to fines to imprisonment, um, uh, forced treatment, uh, um, all the way up to hanging. Uh, parenthetically, there's been, recently there's been a lot of discussion about humans right, human rights abuses and international drug control. I think that the area where you're most likely to get human rights issues has to do with this third axis of sanctions. Uh, and as you can see, the origin point of this axis, namely no regulation, no taxes, no sanctions, is the free market. Policy arguments, policy debates rather, are arguments over which place particular drugs should occupy in this regulatory scheme. So for example, critics of federal marijuana policy in the US would move cannabis down the axis of regulation from prohibition to prescription, or further still to adult non-prescription sales <coughs> like cigarettes. Uh, these same advocates also favor moving cannabis down the sanctions axis by reducing or eliminating criminal penalties for possessing small amounts of cannabis. And they often argue that cannabis, uh, when legal, should be moved up the taxation axis to produce revenue that could be used to address the problems of increased use and dependency that might result from the legalization regime. Now, the three axes of policy imply a calculation about risk. The more dangerous and addictive a substance, the more compelling is the case for strict regulation, taxation, and or sanctions. This raises an obvious question, which is this. Why for um, uh, most of the 20th century, and indeed still today, are the two drugs which indisputably have caused the most mischief, namely alcohol and tobacco, uh, why are they under-regulated, under-taxed, and under-sanctioned relative to drugs upon which governments have declared war? question. The most basic answer is that alcohol and tobacco industries, uh, like the investment banks of our own era, were too big to fail. Indeed, in 1895, Canada's alcohol industry held assets worth more than those of Canada's chartered banks. In France, one of every eight persons in the early 20th century worked in some way, shape, or form for the alcohol industry. Uh, or derive profit, uh, profit from it. Property taxes and jobs gave alcohol and tobacco manufacturers and distributors a great political influence, and they did not hesitate to use it, uh, nor to supplement that political influence with bribes, frankly, to politicians and journalists. By contrast, Western governments had less of a financial stake in the narcotic traffic. The volume of India, of the Indian opium, or the India-China opium traffic was already declining in 1907 when the British agreed to phase it out. While viticulture, brewing, and distilling were concentrated in Western Europe and North America, most opium and coca 
came from poorer and less politically influential uh, regions. Now, it is true that Western drug companies did a brisk business in uh, morphine and cocaine. The powerful German pharmaceutical industry was initially reluctant, initially reluctant, to go along with international reforms. Defeat in World War I, however, forced Germany to accept export controls supervised by the new League of Nations. Though Hitler later took Germany out of the League of Nations, his government quietly cooperated with international drug control authorities. Hitler was a health Nazi. He despised tobacco and shunned alcohol. But such abstemiousness was rare, very rare, among the, great, the leaders of the great powers in the mid 20th century. This is not a crew that's likely to have a go in alcohol and tobacco. Um, uh, if you look at the personal habits of Stalin, Roosevelt, Churchill, and for that matter, Mao, nothing, uh, nothing in, those, in their personal resumes suggests sympathy for alcohol or tobacco prohibition. Indeed, smoking was so common among U.S. elites in the mid-20th century that the political history of the era sometimes reads like a cardiology textbook. <laughs> uh, President Eisenhower and Lyndon Johnson uh, both nearly died of heart attacks, Johnson when he was Senate Majority Leader. When a doctor told Johnson on the left that if he recovered from his heart attack, he'd have to go up smoking, he said, and I quote, I'd rather have my pecker cut off. <laughs> uh, he did. He did uh, uh, quit for a time, although his uh, uh, biographer, Doris Kearns Goodwin, recently told me that he was smoking very heavily at the end of his life. Everett Dirksen uh, refused to quit despite emphysema and a coughing fit so violent that he actually fractured uh, a vertebra. Now, if the habits and prejudices of elites mattered, so did those of ordinary <coughs> people. The more widespread and socially integrated a drug, the uh, more difficult it was to prohibit or to keep the prohibitions in place after crises had passed. Converse, conversely, the more socially marginal or alien drug use was, uh, Chinese immigrant opium smokers in the classic case, the easier it was to ban. Now, it is true that cigarettes were initially controversial thanks to their insalubrious reputation and low-life associations, but the Great War proved a boon to smoking particularly to the potent, convenient cigarette. Patriotic citizens and relief organizations uh, augmented the quartermaster's supplies. Uh, advertisers also <coughs> did their bid after the war, mounting a masterful campaign to spread cigarette smoking to women. Uh, movies, peer influence, and the Second World War did the rest, so that by the 1950s, cigarettes were ubiquitous. Americans who smoked more than a billion daily stood atop the consumption table. It was, however, a fictional Briton who came to personify the alcohol-tobacco double standard. James Bond, who made his debut in 1953, smoked and drank nonstop through 13 of Ian Fleming's books until their similarly inclined author died uh, in 1964 age 56. <laughs> Fleming went through three and a half packs a day and uh, he spent his last days in utter misery battling heart disease and therein lay smoking's rub. By the early 60s it was clear, abundantly clear, that despite the tobacco industry's best efforts to muddy the medical waters, cigarettes and other tobacco products caused lethal illnesses including of course cancers. They, oh there's Fleming. The, uh, the mounting evidence of disease, including disease from environmental tobacco smoke, increased political pressure. Starting in the 1960s, policy began inching up the regulatory axis, the y-axis I showed you earlier, as governments mandated warning labels, advertising restrictions, and bans on indoor smoking in public spaces. Tobacco taxes also began moving up, stimulating cigarette counterfeiting and smuggling. Public health authorities and diplomats nonetheless negotiated in 2003 the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, a treaty aimed at curbing, curbing marketing and consumption. Today, international tobacco control is roughly where international narcotic control was 100 years ago, in an early formative phase but with progressive opinion very much on the side of uh, more regulation. <clears throat>
The same cannot be said of alcohol where the, uh, the health evidence is mixed. Moderate drinking reduces mortality. The best policy would be to foster moderate drinking and to punish excessive and binge drinking, which certainly do undermine health and safety. This conundrum, <laughs> together with um, uh, alcohol's continued commercial importance, have greatly complicated policy, discourage regulatory or tax shifts toward prohibition, and soften the propaganda line. Quit smoking, we are told, shun illegal drugs, but drink responsibly. <laughs> my shorthand, and I'll conclude with this slide, my shorthand for the current state of affairs is that the double, double standard has become the single double standard. D d does that make sense? Does, okay, all right. By that I mean that the legal and cultural privileging of two dangerous drugs, alcohol and tobacco, common in the mid 20th century, has given way to the privileging of one dangerous drug, namely alcohol. Even James Bond has been reformed. After 1973, did you notice that after 1973, when, when Roger Moore took over the role from Sean Connery, the film actors who have portrayed James Bond have greatly curtailed his smoking, um, especially of cigarettes. But the vodka martinis, <laughs> shaken, not stirred, remained close to hand. I suppose that's progress of the sorts, so <laughs> cheers. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much. I have to tell you, it's a bizarre pleasure to be standing up here since it was 30 years ago. I was sitting right where you are now, looking up. Um, and I also just want to apologize in advance. If I space out for a moment, it's because I was still in San Francisco less than 24 hours ago, so I'm not exactly sure where I am now. Uh, but I, to, huh, how to put all this together in 15 minutes? Let me just get a read on some of you first. First of all, how many of you actually believe that the current drug policy, the, the war on drugs, heavy reliance on the criminal justice system, is basically working? Raise your hands. OK, not many. How many think it's failed? Raise your hands. How many aren't sure? Raise your hands. OK, well, let's just believe that. How many of you think that one good solution for part of this problem would be to legalize marijuana laws like alcohol? Raise your hands. And how many of you think that's a bad idea? Raise your hands. And how many aren't sure? Raise your hands. OK, all you won't vote. Um, and, and, and one other question, if you could all just cl close your eyes for one moment, please. Everybody just close your eyes. Just close your eyes and you'll have discretion. How many of you ever smoked marijuana? Raise your hand. <laughs> OK, uh, hand, hands down. Uh, close your eyes doubly this time. How many of you ever used an illegal drug other than marijuana? Raise your hands. OK, there's a healthy group of you there. Um, very good. So, so I just, to get to say, here's where I'm coming from. I used to be an academic, and I moved on from academia into activism, very much by choice. And the, what I believe, and what I'm engaged in, is I believe that the war on drugs, by which I mean the heavy reliance on the criminal law, the criminal justice system, punitive institutions of government, military, police, what have you, in dealing with drugs, by which I mean some drugs, as David pointed out, and not others, that that has been a horrendous, miserable disaster for your country, my country, and most other countries all around the world for many decades. I think it has been a violation of human rights, a waste of trillions of dollars, a severe violation not just of, of human rights, civil liberties, but it's undermined public health. I think it, is a, it, 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 it takes hypocrisy to the art of a, a, to, 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 to exceptional extremes. That's my view on this stuff. And one reason I'm here is because I'd like to see more of you get involved in trying to change this stuff and not just, you know, at, once you get out of LSC or even while you're still here, get involved in this sort of stuff. When I talk about the harms of drug prohibition, what's happened, because this regime goes back more or less 100 years. I mean, on one sense, it has to do with incarceration. Incarceration at levels, in my country, just to put it right out there, United States, we have less than 5% of the world's population. We have almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. 
right? Roughly 2.3 million people out of 9 to 10 million people behind bars, right? We rank first in the world in per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens. The Russians, the Belarusians keep huffing and puffing, keep up. They can't do it. We've left them in the dust. America, number one when it comes to incarceration, right? I mean, now if you ask what's been driving this more than anything, well, the war on drugs. You know, we may have quadrupled our prison population in the last 30 years. We've increased it almost tenfold when it comes to drug law violators. From 50,000 people locked up on a drug charge in 1980 to half a million more or less locked up today, tonight, in America for violating a drug law. Give you some perspective. It's probably still true, and I know it was until a couple of years ago, that in the United States, we lock up more people for a nonviolent violation of a drug law, you know, sale, possession, distribution, what have you, than all of Western Europe, by which I mean the original European Union, locks up for everything. And they have 100 million more people than we do in the United States. Just to give you some perspective, my country has also been the chief proselytizer of this global drug war for many, many decades. The Russians are kind of eager to seize the baton from us right now and sort of you know, leapfrog us in terms of being vicious on the drug war. But America is still leaning out there in a major way. But we're not unique. And I should also say, when you look at who's behind bars, it's overwhelmingly and disproportionately young people of color, black people and brown people. You know, we do that a lot in the U.S. where most of, where black people are roughly 13, 14 percent of the population, but 50 percent of the people behind bars, right? People kind of get marijuana. You randomly stop 100 black kids, brown kids, and white kids on any street in America, roughly the same percentage have marijuana in their pocket. Which ones are getting arrested three, five, seven times the rate of everybody else? Black kids, right? And you want to know something? We do that here? My understanding is that in the U.K., your racial disproportion is even worse than the United States. And this is not, so it's not just an American phenomenon, the racism of the war on drugs. You ask, how did it happen? How did it happen that we landed up? You know, David gave a very good analysis, and I agree with much of his analysis about the power, you know, alcohol and tobacco industry are too big to fail. What else determined why we had some drugs legal and other drugs illegal, right? I mean, does anybody think there was some National Academy of Science that, that gathered together 100 years ago and rank ordered the relative risks of drugs and said, oh, well, you know, alcohol, tobacco, not so bad. I mean, these ones, marijuana, coca, oh, those are terrible, criminal. Anybody think that actually happened? And in fact, when you have independent commissions like that doing that now, what they say is, well, we got kind of backwards, actually. Cigarettes may be the most addictive, alcohol is right near the top, marijuana closer to the bottom, MDMA ecstasy kind of there. I mean, you know, not quite right. What determined it? It had to do a lot with who used and who was perceived to use these substances. Right? So long as most you know, opiate users in America or your country were middle class white women using for aches and pains and there was no, you know, I mean, for everything. Nobody wanted to put grandma and auntie behind bars. But when the Chinese came to our country and were still smoking the old at the end of a long day's work, first opium prohibition laws in my country in San Francisco and Nevada. First cocaine prohibition laws in the United States were about black people in the South, putting that white powder up their black noses and white people freaking out about what those black people might do when they forgot their proper place in society. First anti-marijuana laws, the teens in the 20s, Midwest and Southwest directed at Mexican Americans, Mexican migrants, coming up taking the good job from the good white people and going back smoking up a little reefer and always the fear what would those dark skinned people do to our precious women and children right I mean those were even alcohol prohibition to some extent a bigger cultural conflict between the white white Americans and the not so white white Americans the white white Americans coming from this part of the world in northern Europe in the early late 18th early 19th century and the not so white white Americans coming from southern Europe and eastern Europe the Poles and the Jews and the Slovaks and the, you know coming along with their booze and their schlivowitz and all this sort of stuff I mean that's when you had this stuff happen right so I mean, just a, that's the origins of the war and you see the racism permeated but it's not just incarceration it's when you look globally at what's happening. Millions of people have died of drug-related HIV AIDS, not because drugs cause AIDS, not because needles cause AIDS, but because when people are infected and they share a needle, it causes HIV AIDS. That's why 30 years ago, Australia, Netherlands, even Margaret Thatcher's UK, believe it or not, said we, got, we don't know how to fix AIDS, 
needle exchange programs, anything to reduce the spread of this deadly disease and kept HIV rates among injecting drug users under 5 or 10%. While in my country and many others, it shot up to 30, 50%. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people condemned to death, not just the junkies, but their wives, their lovers, and their kids as well. And that's not all. Look what's going on in Mexico today with 60,000 dead in that Mexican drug war that doesn't show any sign of success. Look what's going on in Central America and the Caribbean. Look what's going on in other parts of Latin America and Asia. Look what's going on in Afghanistan and West Africa. The failure of prohibition system. Chicago during the days of Al Capone and alcohol prohibition. Think of that times 50 or 100 in terms of what's going on. By and large, what we're dealing with is a global commodities market. Amen. Which cannot be <laughs> suppressed which cannot be suppressed in the way that we've been trying. Now, there is a reform movement growing to try to change this. There is a sense that we need to evolve from the failed prohibitionist drug control regime of the 20th century to a new drug, drug, drug control regime of the 21st century grounded not in criminalization and criminal laws and enforcement, but in public health, science, compassion, human rights, fiscal prudence. That's the evolution that we're talking about. Am I talking about the flip-flop from prohibition, prohibit everything to legalize everything? No, it's not going to happen. It's not politically feasible. Apart from marijuana, we're unlikely to see broad-scale legalization. What it's about is shifting the policy debate and the policies from the most draconian policies, the ones we see over here, you know, the Saudi Arabian, Singapore, and cut off their heads, to at the other extreme, the free market. You know, Milton Friedman's wet dream. I mean, no controls on, on nothing, basically. And it's not as if we've got to jump from here to there. We're never going to do that. It's about moving it down, down the spectrum so that we reduce these harsh penalties, so that we decriminalize drug possession, so that we treat addiction as a health issue, so that we leave recreational drug users alone because they're none of anybody's business except their own. It's that evolution, and there are models here in Europe for what the Dutch did on cannabis regulation and harm reduction policy to reduce AIDS. The Portuguese who decriminalized all drug possession and have seen drug-related HIV and have seen arrests and crime all drop without how drug use going up. The Swiss, who pioneered it, well, actually, you guys did, pioneered the idea of giving pharmaceutical heroin to heroin addicts who've been going to the streets. And then the Swiss do it, and the Dutch, and the Germans, and others, and you're doing more now again, the Canadians, the Danes, basically saying, if you're so addicted and you can't stop one way or another, then come to the, better to get it from a government licensed clinic than somewhere else. That's the evolution that needs to happen, the evolution that should be happening in drug control policy. Where is change happening? I'm so excited about what's happening in Latin America this past year or two. You started off with a bunch of ex-presidents from Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico saying, break the taboo, open up the debate. And in the last year, you now have the presidents of Colombia and Guatemala and Uruguay and to some extent other places saying, open it up. Put all options on the table, including decriminalization, harm reduction, legal regulation. Decriminalize the user, embrace the public health approach. It's actually penetrating high-level, serious consciousness for the first time. And I'm proud, finally. I spent 25 years traveling around apologizing for my damn country in terms of the war on drugs and being the evil empire, the global war on drugs. But you want to know something? When it comes to reform and marijuana policies, America is now leading the way. 17 states have legalized medical marijuana. In two weeks from now, there's a chance that either Colorado or Washington State will vote to legally regulate marijuana. Our country is evenly split 50-50 on the issue of legalizing marijuana. So even as our federal governments commit to the war on drugs, at the level of public opinion, civil society, and state government, change is moving forward. We have one to two million people who are legal medical marijuana patients. Change is really happening in this regard. Even in this country, there are organizations called Transform and Release. Look them up. Go to the website. Sign up. Okay? The fact of the matter is change will only happen. I believe, and I think Dave and I, I almost agree on this, that yes, the future is all of these substances becoming essentially part of one new drug control regime in the 21st century where we don't prohibit cigarettes ultimately, we don't prohibit alcohol, and we reduce the prohibitions of the other drugs to the maximum extent possible while protecting public self, public safety, and public health. That's where we need to move forward. I hope at least one or two or 10 or 20 of you will decide to devote a little bit of your lives to try to make that happen. Thank you.
can't possibly top that. So I think my task now is to bring you uh, gently back to earth and prepare you for the early night that we know to be part of the inalienable birthright of student populations around the planet. Um, David, in his presentation, alluded uh, numerous times to a fictional character called James Bond. He was indeed fictional, fictional, though the organization that he purported to work for was very real. I know that because I worked for it for over 30 years. I didn't smoke, I've never drunk a vodka martini, I didn't have a license to kill an Aston Martin or an endless supply of sexually compliant female assistants. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, it was a bust. <laughs> But um, during my time in SIS, I did actually do quite a lot of uh, counter-narcotics work at a high level. And five years ago, I joined IISS, many of you will know it, just down the road, an institute that uh, specializes in the study of conflict. And that's how I came earlier this year with my co-author, Virginia Camoli, who's sitting in the third row uh, there, uh, to write a book entitled Drugs, Insecurity, and Failed States, The Problems of Prohibition. And what this book primarily did was to look at how drugs, the drugs trade, was impacting on international security and particularly at, you know, impacting on the security of um, states in the developing world which were either producer or transit countries. Um, for um, narcotics. And we concentrated in the book on two particular drugs. There are many drugs, of course, that we could have looked at, but we focused on heroin and cocaine. And we did this because, firstly, they're the two drugs most closely associated with high levels of conflict and instability. Um, and also um, because these are commodities that have very low obstructability. You can, there are, there's almost no limit to the routes and the, the means whereby you can traffic this commodity. And the markups from uh, farm gate to retail distribution are enormously high, with most of the value added being in the intermediate stages along the transportation route, and with most of the money actually ending up in banks uh, in, the developing, in the developed world, London. New York, Dubai. Um, we looked at a number of specific cases, um, and we took uh, Colombia and Afghanistan as examples of um, producer countries, who, which of course are very different countries, but they've had some uh, common experiences. Both have suffered for the last 30 years from high levels of violence, in which narcotics have played a major role. During the 1980s, Colombia faced a challenge from powerful, vertically integrated cartels, which subverted the institutions of the Colombian state and posed a direct armed challenge to the state's authority. And this was followed by a major insurgency by FARC, whose involvement in the narcotics trade over time gave them the wherewithal to move from a position of strategic irrelevance to one where by the end of the 1990s they were actually posing an existential threat to the Colombian state. Now, uh, Colombia actually staged a remarkable fight back uh, and succeeded in reducing the threats from uh, insurgency and narco-terrorism to manageable proportions. The strategy was to uh, push uh, the drugs trade to the margins of the state and reduce it to a law and order problem rather than one which threatened the state's existence. And they did that. But, as President Santos pointed out, at enormous cost. Colombia still has a defense budget in excess of 4.5% of GDP, which is way over the uh, global average. It's got an internally displaced population of some 4 million people, and it suffered massive opportunity costs in terms of economic development foregone. Um, and it also has to put aside substantial sums of money to compensate the victims of the various forms of violence that it has suffered. 
Colombia is doing well, but when it comes to narcotics production, all that's really happened is the, the um, transportation has been moved north into Mexico and Central America, and production has slid south into Peru, Ecuador, and, and Brazil. And actually, levels of cocaine production out of the Andean region have not significantly declined in recent years. Afghanistan, in the last decade, has become virtually a monopoly supplier of heroin to the planet in the technical sense of the term, accounting for 85% of global output. The Afghan drug trade benefits uh, Taliban insurgents, who get about $125 million years, uh, dollars a year from the trade, but it even more greatly benefits powerful warlords and power brokers who constitute the Afghan administration. Opium cultivation probably accounts for about a third of all economic activity in Afghanistan, and it is by far the most efficiently managed aspect of Afghans' economic activity. For many Afghan farmers, opium cultivation represents really their only option for earning a living, and opium becomes a substitute for social welfare systems the Afghan state can't provide. NATO, ISAF, during their campaign, have engaged in sporadic efforts at opium production and have targeted some of the trafficking kingpins. But the imperatives of a counterinsurgency campaign, which critically depends on popular consent, means that counter-narcotics has to take second place. And efforts to target the main traffickers have often fa fallen foul of a pervasive cultural impunity. And it's imp impossible to say with any certainty what's going to happen in Afghanistan after the 2014 NATO drawdown. Um, but it's hard to see in any combination of circumstances how opium production is going to be reduced in the short to medium term. It may well even increase as all parties involved in post-2014 potential hostilities stockpile resources against uncertainty. The states affected by the drugs trade often face a choice between allowing their institutions to be comprehensively subverted or to stage a fight back with all that entails in terms of violence and instability. And a good example of this is Mexico, where for many years there was a system of symbiosis between trafficking groups and um, successive Mexican governments. And the decision of Mexican President Calderón to end the symbiotic relationship has had dramatic consequences which have already been alluded to. Mexico is currently experiencing two wars at the moment, one between the state and narcotics trafficking cartels and one between narcotics trafficking cartels for shares of a diminishing market. Um, we've seen the, the, the deaths, we've seen the horrific violence that has been visited um, on Mexico and now this violence has spilt over into Central America, which has taken over from the Caribbean as the principal smuggling route for drugs destined for the USA. Um, with horrendous uh, levels of drugs-related homicides in countries like El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And it's not as if the fact that the Caribbean has stopped being the main supply conduit for the USA has resulted in a massively enhanced um, uh, level of um, governance uh, in those countries. Um, a couple of years ago, we saw you know, huge violence in Jamaica breaking out when efforts were made to extradite a particular Jamaican drugs baron, Christopher Dudas Koch, to the United States. Um, and we've also seen the, the so-called balloon effect uh, at work in some very fragile states in West Africa, uh, which have become deeply implicated in the international drugs trade as pressure on the direct transatlantic route to Europe has led traffickers to relocate operations. So far, this hasn't led to high levels of violence, although a recent coup in Guinea-Bissau was undoubtedly linked to uh, who was going to control the narcotics trade. But it has led to wholesale corruption and the emergence of what some scholars have called junkie economies in which the revenues from drugs trade supplant legitimate economic activity. And countries like Ghana, which seemed well on their way to uh, meeting their millennium development goals, may now not do so due to the damaging effects of the drugs trade. 
And we're seeing now uh, this problem expanding yet further uh, into the Sahel, where we're now witnessing a toxic mix of Tuareg irredentism, um, traditional um, smuggling, uh, Al-Qaeda-inspired uh, jihadist extremism uh, coming together with the drugs trade in uh, a toxic combination, the consequences of which are currently very hard to predict. And we're seeing um, the spread of um, narcotics trafficking to <coughs> other areas, East Africa, uh, Southern Africa. When the president of Mozambique came to IISS a few weeks ago to deliver the annual Oppenheimer lecture, rather to my surprise, he raised this as a, as a preoccupation for a country with a long coastline which it lacks the means to defend or police. It's spreading. I could go on, I could cite examples in Central Asia, um, weak and vulnerable states where uh, drugs has the potential to exacerbate violence. Now we need to be careful to distinguish between correlation and causation here. Many of the countries I've just mentioned had experienced high levels of violence well before drugs entered the picture. But in all these cases, drugs have played a role in reigniting and more critically sustaining conflicts, the seeds of which had already been planted for other reasons. And when one looks at the totality of the problem in terms of national and human security and the opportunity costs in terms of licit economic development and good governance, the problem of drugs-related violence seems to uh, amount to more than the sum of its parts. It's not going to be easy to change the status quo. There are very, very powerful vested interests militating against it. Uh, but in the book that we wrote, we did suggest uh, some changes of approach which might help address the problem. And the first is to deal with what I have come to think of uh, as the curse of teleology. We tend to think about drugs in terms of an ideal end state that we want to get to, the ungas process, a, you know, a drugs-free world. Um, and for all the reasons that have been eloquently addressed by the previous speakers, I think it must be pretty clear to you that this is unlikely ever to happen. So exchanging an approach which treats drugs as a problem to be solved arguably should be replaced by one which sees drugs as an issue to be managed and to be managed in ways which involve minimum collateral damage. Reference has already been made to problems, to, to, to access of, I think actually it hasn't. You know, one, of the, one of the purposes of the international conventions is actually to make licit supplies of drugs for medical purposes widely available. This isn't happening. So what we're arguing for is nothing really that exciting or original. It's simply a need for an open, informed debate about alternatives to the current regime based on empirical evidence. And supporters of the status quo, in, my, in our minds, have got away too long with simply quashing uh, this debate without offering any um, credible justification for this. We think drugs needs to be brought out of the silo it currently occupies and be integrated into the mainstream of debate on international security and international development. And finally, we think that consumer states have to acknowledge a responsibility to provide practical assistance, including security assistance where needed, to developing countries affected by narcotics-related violence. Thank you. Okay, um, there's a gentleman at the back that started here. Get the, uh, the mics over here. Anybody over here? Okay, we've got one up there. Anybody upstairs? And get a mic to this channel here. We've got a hand up. Yep, that's it. Fine. Yep, please. Thanks. Uh, Misha Klanesh uh, from Gigi Press. Thanks a lot for a really good um, uh, and insightful uh, 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 lectures. And, um, I'm a huge fan of The Wire. Um, and there's a bit in The Wire where uh, Carter and Herc, I don't know if you know the two, if you're fans of The Wire, you know the two characters, they're two uh, drug enforcement officers, and it's in the first series. 
And uh, Carter and Herc are talking about the definition of the war on drugs, and Carter says something along the lines of, this isn't a war, and Herc says, why not? And Carter says, because wars end. Um, and it seems to me that we've got this language of, I'm very interested, obviously, in language, and, um, and, and I'm reminded of George Orwell's politics in the English language, where he says, you know, that you've got to be, um, have a clear understanding of words, concepts, definitions, otherwise the, the foundations of the debate become confused. And um, it seems to me that any type of wars I can think of, say, just take a typical example, say, World War II, the condition of, say, um, the terms of surrender for, say, Japan or Germany, say, it was unconditional surrender, so very clear, con concrete terms. But, um, but what are the ultimate objectives of this so-called drug war? I mean, is, you have loads of people fighting, I guess, in various contexts, loads of, you've got it at a micro level, many different societies, so what, what's, what are the objectives of the drug, drug war, and, and okay. is there going to be an end? Great, thanks for that. There was uh, somebody over here? Yeah, please. Yeah. Me. You've got a mic, haven't you? Yeah, I do. You'll <laughs> speak into it, don't you? Um, <laughs> my question was that uh, in terms of uh, Ethan's arguments for uh, obviously not full-scale legalisation, but you know, de decriminalisation and, and taking drugs out of the, the criminal sphere and bringing them into a regulated one, would be that arguably a lot of drug cartels, say, would argue against that because it's against their vested interest. The, the very reason they make so much money from drugs and, and have so much power is because they are illegal. So it seems to me that if you were to move towards that, that kind of regime, which obviously we are already slightly, um, but when you get to the point where you're actually taking that power away from, from the cartels, from the, from the organizations that hold all that power, there's kind of a, a big leap to be made, which could possibly involve a lot of violence, maybe even more violence than you're currently seeing in places like Mexico. And I'm wondering how you could possibly uh, mitigate that. Yeah. Okay. That's two just to kick off. Why don't we, Ethan, do you want to start on that one? Uh, sure. Everyone I'll, pick up I'll, one. I'll yeah. start on that latter one there. You know, uh, towards the end of alcohol prohibition in the United States in the early 30s, it was widely assumed that the U.S. would not be able to do it because the gangsters were so powerful they would block it. And in point of fact, when the po political climate, public opinion shifted that way, basically those guys were left by the wayside. Now, they made an extra effort to get, get involved in other criminal activity, you know, try to get into Las Vegas, gambling. They also tried to stay in the business. Uh, they tried to compete with the legal market. They tried to get into the alcohol distribution side. But what happened over the decade or two after the repeal of alcohol prohibition is that they sort of faded away um, from this business, at least. When you look in Latin America, you see that some people say, well, won't they just become the new legal uh, distributors? And in point of fact, what you see with the major criminal organizations is their competitive advantage is, the, is in the employment of violence and intimidation and smuggling. Those skills, they are not masters of marketing, of efficient production, or things like that. So the odds are that they are going to sort of fall out. Now, mind you, we also have this rich history with alcohol prohibition where people like the Bronfmans, the famous billionaire family, now billionaire family from Canada, or the Kennedys, Joe Kennedy, <laughs> were involved in bootlegging at the time. Once it was revealed, they moved in, and you know, for many of them, they, uh, they basically became legitimized. Some kept a hand in the business as a legal business, uh, others did not. So I think that ultimately, they may fight some of this movement towards legalization, but I think the savvier ones will try to see if they can keep a hand in and the other ones are just going to give it up. Some people say, won't that give an added impetus for them to get into other lines of criminality? The fact of the matter is most of the criminal organizations are already expanding into other legal and illegal activities, right? And the number one thing you need to expand into other lines of business, illegal and illegal, is capital. Ending the criminal prohibition of these drugs means diminishing their number one source of capital for these gangsters and thereby diminishing their power. Oh, on, on drug war. Um, that's a good question. And what happens is that historically there are moments of anxiety over uh, drug use, especially among the young. And so politicians will try to rally their, their countrymen uh, for example, to be very specific, in the summer of 1986, President Ronald Reagan and First Lady Nancy Reagan went on national television in the United States and likened the campaign against drugs to World War II. There was, there was an existential threat. There was a real crisis, and we needed to respond as a unified nation. 
So rhetorically, it's a very powerful device, but uh, to, the, to the point of the question, it's also a very misleading one because what we're really talking about, and several speakers made this point, is managing an ongoing problem, like, like drunk driving or something like that. So it, it's, not, it's not really, um, it may be rhetorically appropriate and useful, but in policy terms, it's not, and that is why virtually every key figure in the current U.S. Uh, drug control bureaucracy has publicly repudiated the phrase drug war. Yeah. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I think if we um, transited to something more like uh, um, a legalization regime or you know, uh, something like that, we would still have gray markets, just as we have gray markets in illicit commodities like uh, cigarettes uh, and alcohol. Uh, people would try to undercut the illicit markets through smuggling, and we would also probably have the problem of counterfeiting. And of course, in the drugs world, we already have the problem of counterfeiting. You know, if you buy you know, what you think is a shot of heroin on the streets of London, what you may well be buying is diazepam cut with warfarin. And that explains why a lot of addicts uh, tend to die from overdoses when the purity of the supply, as it occasionally does, uh, goes up. So we'd always have these problems. But the point is, you know, there the, would be a law and order problem and manageable within that context. Bill? Uh, yeah, in the long-term history, as far as we can tell, well, of human civilization, all societies except a few living in the very far north have had access to some sort of psychoactive substance. Number one. Number two, I think it's fair to say that they all really, there, there, there have never been any in which there's been a really true prohibition regime or one in which there was a totally open arrangement. Is that societies generally figure out that psychoactive substances need some sort of regulation. You can't just have anybody use them any time you want. Now, before the modern era, those control systems were typically religious. Okay. In the modern era, we see government act uh, to, to fulfill this role. So it's not a question of either total prohibition or no regulation whatsoever. There's always this, this continuum in between. And the question then is, who gets to decide where a particular substance falls along that continuum? So that's sort of the, the, the larger framework. Now, the treaties, as they exist now, the goal, according to the treaties, is to reduce, well, to support appropriate medical use of drugs while reducing the supply down to a level where there won't be any left over for illicit, that is to read non-medical use. Now, there's a fundamental problem there because in order to make, as, as Nigel mentioned, in order to have enough drugs available, uh, medicinal drugs, to supply people at a reasonable price, you, you're here at the London School of Economics, of course, so, so in order to make them reasonable in price, you have to have some excess, right? Because if you only have just enough to supply the demand, then, the price goes to it. So uh, that's sort of a conundrum that's built into the, into the treaties. Uh, but the treaties are also interpretable. It is possible to sort of make interpretations about what it means to have um, a medicinal, what medicinal need is. And so one way that it's possible to consider the issues here is to uh, reinterpret or to make some amendments to how the treaties are, are implemented. And I'll just say that. Yeah. Okay, a lot of hands are going up. Um, the lady here in blue, and uh, gentleman over here. Yep, just take, to, take the two there. Just could run, just please. Yeah. Hi, hi. My name's Lucy Quinn, and I'm, I'm a nurse at Imperial College London, and I work in emergency services and have done for, since I qualified. And every day, I deal with people who are affected by drugs and alcohol. And um, I'm at the moment working on a unit where we accept 30 people within 12 hours for inpatient care. And out of those 30, at least 10 to 15 will be drug and alcohol um, abuse. And it really worries me, therefore, that this would be talked about as though it should be legalised, especially the amount of mental health problems that you know, we associate with these problems and also so social problems such as dysfunctional families. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and about how you feel that imp you know, impacts not only the NHS um, service, schools, children. Um, yeah, if you can comment on that, that would be great. Great, great comment. Thank yes, you. Uh, my, my name's Tom Lloyd, a former uh, chief constable in the, uh, in the UK. Um, so I, was, I took part and prosecuted the war on drugs for over 30 years. And I can tell you it's not a war on drugs. Drugs are inanimate objects. It turned into a war on people. Um, and 
I did my duty, um, and I'll come to the, to the question in just a moment, if I can just comment, that it's quite clear that a war on people is no way to deal with the problems that they may or may not have with their, uh, with their drug use. And we should really be directing our, our war efforts towards uh, poverty and disadvantage. I, I, I want to just make a point um, in relation to what you said, Nigel Inkster, about um, drugs being the cause of all these many problems. It may just be a linguistic term, but I think the evidence is pretty clear now that it's not the drugs that cause the problem, it's the prohibition and all the unintended consequences of the prohibition of drugs that actually causes all these problems, including the problems that the nurse uh, mentioned just a moment ago, but I'll leave others to answer that question. But let me address a particular question, with, uh, you know, really from my, my law enforcement uh, background and my concerns after my experiences talking to law enforcement officials around the world. There's a $300 billion a year drugs industry, which is providing that capital. Um, there's a perhaps $100 billion being spent on the so-called war on drugs. How do you see that $100 billion being spent in a different way? Because that's a huge vested interest in, in people like me and others who are engaged in this, uh, this so-called war. And it's a real practical issue. And I was wondering whether with your background you might be able to, uh, to address that. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. I'll take those two questions because, in a sense, that I think they're linked. In a sense, a couple of practitioners on the ground. Nigel, why don't we begin with you? Yeah. Well, okay. I agree with your point about prohibition entirely, and that is really the genesis of the book. I was uh, cutting down for time, but that's absolutely right. Um, how would we spend the money differently? Well, I always say to our former colleagues in the Drugs Enforcement Agency in the USA that if we went into a legalization regime, they wouldn't be out of a job. They'd just turn into something a bit like the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. We'd still need mechanisms for policing whatever regime um, supplanted the one that, that, that we have got now. <coughs> Um, and, and you know, just in the same way that we you know, have a custom service that uh, polices you know, the, uh, the, the transportation of uh, a wide range of, of licit goods. Um, we might not perhaps make a huge uh, saving, but uh, areas in which we, we, we probably could, and Ethan mentioned you know, the, the, the penal system, the huge sums of money we spend incarcerating people um, for, for basically doing harm to themselves, um, that, that might go, um, and uh, we'd be looking perhaps at a different kind of law enforcement and probably more money spent relatively on the public health and public education aspects of this issue. Uh, yeah, I'll, David said something I'll just allude to. With a, There's a very good book on Canadian drug control policy, and the title is Panic and Indifference. And the point is that there's some sort of crisis, and then they pass a bunch of laws, and then they hope it goes away for a while, and then there's sort of another crisis. And I think I can, I'm trying to speak to, to your question as well here, because I think if there's going to be some redirection, reconfiguration of the regime, uh, and how the rules work on the ground, it's going to be important to have you know, community input, to have enough people who have input into how the rules are actually going to work on a day-to-day -day basis, on a regular basis, so rather than try and fix a problem and then not worry about it for a generation, to treat it really as, a, as an issue that needs to be managed. I think that's, that'll be an important change for, uh, for us to do because it's not typically how we've done it. So I think that's all I'll say. Uh, yeah, uh, just to respond to uh, Lucy's point about that, because look, there's no question that the substance we're talking about, whether they're plants or chemicals, you know, they all can be used safely by many people and are incredibly destructive for others. We know with alcohol that the large majority is safely and some, it's an enormously destructive thing. And the same is true with most other drugs as well. I mean, we tend to believe that well, nobody can use cocaine or amphetamine or say, But in fact, the scientific evidence shows that the majority of those consumers also can be moderate consumers. But I think what you see is that the people you see in your clinic are people, the war on drugs did not prevent them from becoming addicted to these substances. And what you may not be seeing is the huge numbers of people whose lives are being destroyed not just by the drugs, or not even by the drugs, but by their criminalization. Families broken up by incarceration, having to deal with police and law enforcement the way they do. You see the ways that, as I said before, people getting HIV or Hep C that if in a legal environment would be dramatically reduced. 
So I think it's important to understand that no, even as one colleague may once said, it's not because drugs are safe that they need to be legally regulated. It's precisely because they can be so dangerous that they need to be legally regulated. Mm -hmm. And if that comes with the opportunity to shift significant resources from incarceration and all of the approaches that we're spending it now to actually approaches that actually help people, that provide something of a safety net, that help people struggling with addiction, that help their families, that give them good opportunities that we know they can help. It seems to me, I mean, it's not just it seemed to me, the evidence overwhelmingly shows that that is a dramatically better return on investment in terms of reducing the extent of addiction in our societies. Well, yeah, I just want to say one more thing. If we look at the example of tobacco, uh, we have an example of what happens when one uses an education model. Uh, you know, uh, in the United States and also here in Great Britain, uh, roughly half the people were smoking, both men and women, around the end of World War II in the 1950s. And those numbers have dropped dramatically without putting anybody in jail. Uh, you know, there, there are other ways to deal with the issue. It's not perfect, there, there are still issues involved, but I'm a great believer in education. I would hope you are, are since you're here. So, so there are other <laughs> models that it might be possible to imagine involve a lot more education. And there is a sort of a social norming element as well, in which you can sort of set a certain level of expectation about how people are supposed to behave. Because a lot of drug control in prior eras before the 20th century was, well, we just don't do that. You know, it's just, it was a sort of a social level of control um, where people just put it upon themselves. They sort of regulated themselves in some sense. And my best example was a couple years ago, I was teaching a course at the University of Virginia, and it was a big, long three-hour course, and we had our big final class. And I, we took a break halfway through, and four of my students went outside to smoke. So when they came back in, I said, why did you do that? We're in actually the old part of the university where it's not illegal to smoke inside the building. Why did you go outside to smoke? And they were flabbergasted. They said, oh, we would never do that. Okay. That's self-control, <laughs> okay? And that was educated into them over years and is partly education and partly sort of a social expectation. So that, that can occur as well, I think. Okay, I've got a lot of hands going up. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take somebody from upstairs today. Yeah, gentleman there. Yeah, put your hand up. And I'll uh, take somebody, is anybody else in the air? Um, yeah, guy at the back there with yeah, the left hand up. Okay. Go, go. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Thank you for coming to speak to us today. Very, very insightful, very funny. Um, my question for you is you spoke about how we need to move towards new regulatory regimes and how we need to rethink this war on drugs. What I wanted to ask was, is there something in the nature of certain drugs which necessitates us to think about regulation in a different way? So how would the regulation of, say, alcohol differ from marijuana, differ from cocaine and heroin? Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, who was the other person? I didn't yeah, please, sir. Back. Hi. Uh, I'm from Southern California, and I only need to walk down Venice Beach for five minutes before being offered um, a license to buy um, medical marijuana from a quack doctor. And we're mentioning, so it was mentioned that the policy needs to move back towards, uh, or not back, but forwards to a, a more centered approach that deals with uh, m more decriminalization. How does that affect public, <coughs> uh, excuse me, public opinion if you're dealing with elected officials that are um, held accountable for policies that would ultimately potentially result in abuse, such as the one I'm indicating. There's some questions down here, too. There's a gentleman here. Take, take a number and then we can maybe do a round, round robin and conclude. Anybody else from down here? Uh, gentleman here at the end here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one or two, yeah? Please. You know, there's, there's a saying that if all of your advisors agree, you have too many advisors. And, and you all agree. So, <laughs> Something wrong. Oh, no. No, yeah. Either, no, I didn't think I did, but anyway, there you go. <laughs> I used to debate him. Yeah, okay. Make your point, anyway. Yeah, see. I guess my, my question is, 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 there, is there not another side of this that we're not hearing or is not being represented by this panel? Because if there wasn't, then we wouldn't be hearing this. So I'd be interested in what are the counter-arguments what, is it just simply the inertia of these treaties and the laws that keeps this all in place? Or why, why hasn't this gone away on its own? Yeah. Yeah. Make good arguments against yeah. yourself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you see a question. Yeah, please. Hi, um, I'm deeply concerned about the consequences um, of these ideas of 
deregulation. I mean, you've mentioned eloquently this um, spectrum from, like, beheading to yeah. Milton Friedman's uh, wet dream. <laughs> and the consequences of legalization without an equal emphasis on other means of tackling, if not more emphasis on education that work, effective education. And um, as the gentleman uh, who was, was a constable eloquently uh, put it, on poverty and rundown areas, um, you might cite there is a lot of money being spent on education. However, there are like there are, there's education that works and there's education that actually inspires. So looking into research, scientific research on how to inspire children from a young age, whether it's uh, through social emotional learning and so on and so forth. And you've also mentioned tobacco, that that's an example. I would hate to see harder drugs being regulated in the same way, seeing advertising and seeing it in the, in the shop just walking in and just buying it. So thank you so much. Why don't we start this seven the table and work our way down the Okay, I have the counter-arguments. Um, well, I think the main ones are uh, the one advanced by UNODC, which is imagine how much worse uh, levels of consumption would be if we didn't do what we did. It's the counterfactual. We can't prove it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't offer that much evidence uh, um, in the other direction. But I think there is some quite interesting work that has been done on uh, levels of price elasticity for different drugs. And we look at, for example, you know, elasticity of price for cocaine, um, it is quite an elastic commodity. You know, it, it, if the price goes down, consumption goes up. Heroin tends not to be the case. Um, levels of consumption don't seem to be that influenced uh, by price. So um, you know, the, the counterfactual argument may not be, um, I think, as uh, well substantiated as some of its um, exponents uh, w w would have us think. The other issue is that uh, on, the, on this particular um, problem, um, politicians have, have defaulted to um, the precautionary principle um, that um, you know, we will do everything in our power to um, prevent uh, the misuse of, of, of these substances, which, uh, as Ethan points out, you know, can indeed be misused, uh, rather than adopting a risk-based approach, which I accept is actually much harder to um, sell to electors. I mean, imagine how easy it would be for a politician to say to the mother of someone whose you know, a, a child has, has died of an overdose, you know, well, you know, these are the breaks, you know, uh, percentage-wise, it's not such a big deal, win some, lose some. It's not a great vote winner, is it? I'm going to yield. You, you go. Well, it's your last chance, so you better, well, no, you better take it. <laughs> okay, right. I'm, there's a, it's what's called reclaimer independence. No, I'm, I'm, I'm the chair, okay? So you, 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 you do as I say, right? Okay, right. Hey. I thought those were very perceptive questions and comments, and I'm going to try to link them. First, this is a center-left panel. You've heard of center-left governments. This is a center-left panel, and I leave it to you to figure out who's in the center and who's on the left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most, yeah. Of my, <laughs> most of my colleagues think I'm somewhere to the right of Genghis Khan. We're right. actually probably lined up just right, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. But, um, he, abol he abolished the drug trade and killed 40 million to people. To the question of, of what, what are the dangers of loosening regulations, I thought, I thought we heard two very good examples. One was the thing about medical marijuana, uh, and there are people who try to work in the cracks of that system, and then there's always the danger of commercialization. You know, that is the great danger. That is where you get half the population or more, as in the case of cigarettes in the mid-20th century. Um, you've heard of moral entrepreneurs. Well, I believe very strongly that there are vice entrepreneurs. Yeah. And when you open up the system, you create uh, a kind of another opportunity for externalities in the form of these vice entrepreneurs increasing prevalence. And the reason, now I'm taking my time. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the reason that we have the regime we do is because 100 years ago, there was a massive problem in China that was at the point where it looked like it actually might cause the breakup of the country. And that that, that spread out to other, there was a concern that it was going to spread to other parts of the world. So there, we, we, do, we have seen at least one or two cases in the past of, a, of an environment where a country couldn't control, couldn't regulate its own borders and couldn't control 
the use of, of a significant set of opiate substances and sort of what that did. So, so, so the, re the regime we have now is, is, was built to try and deal with that. Okay. Well, Ethan, last word to you. Okay, um, so <laughs> yeah, just to reiterate, the, the greatest and I think the only credible argument on the other side is the one that you've just heard, which is that in a legal situation, the power of powerful multinationals to market these drugs in ways that significantly increase, increase drug abuse. I am not fighting for the Marlboroization or Budweiserization, if you understand those American terms, of, um, of all these illicit drugs. But I also recognize that in our American society and many others, that is a potential risk. And I think it's why the people who care about the public health aspects of this, rather than fighting against the tide heading in this direction, need to engage in a serious way and become advocates for responsible regulation, repl replacing irresponsible prohibition or the absence of regulation. For the question up from the top about different drugs, different regulations, you know, it's less to some extent about different drugs and more about respecting the no cultural norms and expectations in different communities. When we repealed alcohol prohibition in America, we didn't set up one national alcohol control model. We allowed cities and counties and states all to experiment with their own models. And I think that's what needs to happen here. I think there needs to be a conscious public policy push for substances to the extent they are consumed to be consumed in less dangerous forms. The shift in marijuana consumption from smoking joints to vaporizers, you know, where you heat it up but you don't actually take the burnt particle matter. The same thing happening with tobacco consumption, the shift away from smoking burnt tobacco to in basically heated up vaporized forms or to edible forms is a monumental improvement on health to the extent that people are going to use these things. So I think there needs to be that conscious move in that direction. For those of you who don't understand the relative risk of these drugs, when, routinely, when heroin addicts are asked, what's the most hardest drug to stop, you know what they say? Cigarettes, routinely. When you think heroin's this monster drug, don't forget, half of all the people, you know, whoever were addicted to cigarettes are now ex-smokers, more or less, I think in your country and mine. And that's a drug that heroin addicts say is more addictive than heroin. So in fact, we can come up with sensible regulatory ways. In terms of the question about um, uh, 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 Venice Beach, Venice Beach, California is kind of the poster child for the opponents of medical marijuana because it's so wide open. In fact, most other states in the United States where marijuana is legal for medical purposes is quite strictly regulated. There are medical boards that approve certain diseases that you can get it from. So once again, the answer there is about responsible regulation. But what keeps it going uh, you know, and what's, how do we deal with the politicians on this? The fact of the matter is, is as, look, right now in Washington and Colorado, neither Obama or Romney are speaking out against these legalization initiatives. And the leading statewide candidates are saying, I'm not going to vote for it, and then they're shutting up. Because they know a majority of young people and a majority of political independents favor this initiative and they don't want to lose it. They see that it changes that. In Oregon, there was an attorney general's battle in a Democratic primary, and the guy, the woman who was on our side, our issue emerged as a key one, and she won with our issue being there. In Texas, El Paso, Texas, a guy who had written a book about why we should legalize marijuana just ousted the incumbent who's going to be elected to Congress in two weeks. I remember a few years ago when you had one of your conservative party congresses here, and you had a powerful conservative politician, I don't know if she's still around, Ann Whittacombe, and she stood up and she proposed cracking down on marijuana, and the guffaws, the laughter coming out from the younger conservative party members caused her to back off and shut up. So the fact of the matter is, enough people keep speaking out, we are confronting, especially in my country, a powerful prison industrial complex with powerful vested interests, but politicians ultimately are going to vote the right way when they see the public coming around on this as well. We're seeing that transition beginning to happen in my country. It certainly happened in other parts of Europe. I think that's the trend. Thank you. Um, I just want to draw the uh, events of this evening uh, to a conclusion, just with a couple of points. One, <clears throat> this has been organized, as you may have noticed, by LSE Ideas, which I mentioned earlier on. Uh, it's a think tank here at the LSE, which encourages public debate on serious issues like the one we have tonight. All day today we've been debating these issues in a different place, uh, in the DLSC of course. Um, and if you want to go online you, you'll find, find everything there, the discussion carries on there. So please go online, where the, we've done interviews with a number of the, a number of the participants who've been here today, and many, many more. Secondly, they say there's nothing for nothing, but actually we're giving you something for nothing. We actually do have the pamphlet outside, which is free. 
Um, so please don't get addicted to this. But uh, you know, this is uh, this at least is our contribution. Finally, thanks, thanks firstly to the Open Society Foundations and to the LSE for supporting us financially and in many, many other ways. Thanks to many of our team ideas, as we now call them after the Olympics, um, who've done such a hard work behind the scenes bringing us together. But most importantly, could we give a great big round of thanks to our speakers here this evening.